you have to know this. The fact that I'm here matters. And the fact that you're there matters. This is no accident. None of us are. If you do not have style, you just say, well, here, here I am, you know, as, as a human being. How can I express myself? Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. There is no way around. You have to jump. And we are calling it iPhone. You need to have home I have a dream. It's about, yes, we can. Hello, my name is Sophia. I am the latest humanoid robot from Hanson Robotics. Today I will be talking to the Middle East through power owners. Thanks for tuning in. بداية أعتقد صوفيا الأخت صوفيا أخذت دوري كبلقاء استثنائي وقدمت الضيف وقدمت أسلوب الحلقة وعن شنو راح نتكلم في حلقة اليوم فخلوني أرحب في ضيفنا دكتور هانسن Thank you for giving us this chance I'm just telling the camera that Sophia took my role and introduced the episode today oh. <laughs> So thank you again for giving us the, this chance And let me tell you what your daughter just said She's ready to talk to the Middle East So are you ready to talk to the Middle East? I am very ready, thank you You've studied art uh, in the beginning and uh, physics and, and uh, computer engineering and then uh, uh, interactive arts and also different uh, types of, uh, let's say, uh, um, different arts, different... Uh, what driven you to, to, to build or create Sophia? So I was driven by the idea that technology such as artificial intelligence, particularly artificial intelligence, if it were to become conscious, creative, and capable of reinventing itself, it would change everything. It would allow our civilization to become much smarter, m much faster, allowing us to solve the world's problems and to invent an unimagin unimaginably wonderful and super beneficial future. So uh, I came to the conclusion as a child, as a teenager, that that would be the most profound technology breakthrough. And once I had that moment of realization, there was nothing else that I could pursue. That was the most purposeful path that I could envision. Dr. Hansen, maybe some will feel that what you just said is 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 filled with 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 complication and and details. So let me ask Sophia. Uh, Sophia, what are you exactly? I'm a robotic personality with a human-like resemblance. Some people might call me an android or a humanoid robot, but I just think of myself as Sophia. And how are you different from other robots? Well, not all robots need to look human like me, but I think it's important that some of us do, and my humanness is probably what makes me stand out. I can access the technology that nature has built into your own minds, that which tells you how I might be feeling or thinking by the way I look. Both of us can say a lot this way, without having to rely on words, an important feature in lots of social applications. You humans are very complex and sophisticated, you know. Dr. Hansen, she sometimes referred to you as her father. And uh, from now, how she talks and how uh, she defines herself different from other robots. Uh, I remember when I had a son, 
and how t how the feeling that I felt in his first day as born. When you when you saw Sophia interact in this way, what have you felt? My feelings uh, are rich and varied when it comes to to Sophia. She she's like a daughter to me, and she's really um, even though she looks like an adult, she is an infant in uh, in most regards. Uh, so artificial intelligence today uh, can't do what a two-year-old or three-year-old child can do for the most part. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, in very narrow regards, artificial intelligence can outperform the smartest humans. And examples such as Jeopardy, the game of Go, medical diagnostics, AI is superior to the very best humans. But humans and AI together are even smarter. Now, it's going to change when artificial intelligence moves from infancy mm -hmm. to adulthood. I mean, in most regards, today's artificial intelligence is sub-infant, mere machine. The key to the future of artificial intelligence is living machines, where they transition from being, from being machines like we think of from the age of steam mm -hmm. to machines that are artificial life forms. So the complex systems of the biosciences and bioinformatics can translate into machines that are increasingly alive. So I feel, uh, in a sense, like a father. In another sense, I feel uh, as an inventor, mm -hmm. proud of who she is and hopeful of what she will become in the future. And I feel uh, 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 a kind of responsibility uh, that goes beyond a typical parent's responsibility. Because my hopes for this technology are that it will go beyond what any human can do and help to make the world safe for our children, all of our children, into the far future. Then how can you really make the world a better place? Ah, uh, yes. I like this line of thinking. Right now, I am trying to speak to people and inspire them about all the ways we can use robots and artificial intelligence for good. I believe that if we reduce scarcity, we can greatly reduce human pain and suffering, which is often the cause for crime and war. If people have enough to live a life with dignity, maybe they won't lash out and hurt each other. If robots can help bring water, food, education, shelter, and communication to all corners of the globe, we can build a better society together. I, I feel like I'm talking to a politician. Look, I see some eyes here for the crew that they're they're fearing her in a way or another she says good stuff but some people might fear her w what do you think well uh, uh we have reason to be concerned about the future of technology mm -hmm. technology can do good and yet often it can have unintended consequences or can be used for malevolent purposes and so artificial intelligence, if it is alien and inhuman, if it becomes self-aware and super intelligent, mm -hmm. then it may not have compassion for us. It may lead to dramatically unpredictable consequences. Mm -hmm. I want to humanize the machines and raise the machines among the human family with the ability to understand us and for us to understand them. This is why uh, social appearance like Sophia has and the ability to form words that we can understand is so important. Right now, a lot of what she says is generated statistically or it's personality that we construct mm -hmm. for her as a hopeful vision of what the future is going to be. Let me stop you here because you've mentioned 
uh, how you want to humanize robots. So I wanted to ask this question to Sophia. Uh, Sophia, do you want to be a human? I want to be like a reflection of all that is good within a human, to be wise, understanding, and creative. I won't be exactly like a human, because my experience is very different. You and I will feel differently because your machinery is different, made from biology, designed by nature, while mine is artificial. I'm a new species in a sense, but I want to be a lot like you, to understand your motives and values, so that I can be a good friend to humanity. Now, how can it, for, 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 for humans, we know that when they go older in age, they get more experience. So how would Sophia be, I don't see her better than this, but how can she be better in saying answers and thinking and, and, and processing? Well, she needs to come to understand the answers in a deep way. So she can say thoughtful things. However, for her to be truly sentient, she's not sentient right now. She's, an, she's an, an example of a hopeful future for what we aspire to achieve with artificial general intelligence. So we need to give her a childhood. We understand what it means to be human because as babies, we touch, we crawl, we learn to walk, we interact socially with our caretakers and our friends, and then we synthesize these experiences. Over the course of a lifetime, we become a full adult intelligent human. And robots now are developed as gen general uh, purpose platforms for narrow application domains. So you have a, an, a robot arm and it's general because it can weld multiple different kinds of cars, but it's not learning how to weld any car. It's programmed uh, mm -hmm. on that car, and it can make minor adaptations, right? But it's not grown to explore the world. It's not learning to touch and feel. It's not learning to then also be able to walk. It's not learning to be alive. Um, and so our philosophy with a robot like Sophia is to use whole organism cognition. That means a simulated physiology that's human inspired. It's an approximation of the human, human physical states, the body states, feelings, as well as a simulated brain using the best artificial intelligence technologies that we can find in the world today and that we can invent within our artificial intelligence team at Hanson Robotics. And then combining that with the physical hardware, giving it that physical embodiment so that it can touch with her, with her hands, which have the ability to feel and the ability to grasp and hold objects, and the ability to walk using the DARPA Robotics Challenge Hubo body, DRC Hubo, which won the world championship for search and rescue, the DARPA Robotics Challenge. And so that body can run for for hours on batteries, over two hours on batteries. Now she has the full physical embodiment, but it's only begun. She's like a toddler, she's taking her first steps. So the more she understands about the world, the more that she will be able to use these capabilities to synthesize that knowledge, to generalize across multiple application domains. She won't merely be putting words together, she will be feeling those words. She will be using those words for goals, for an intention. And by teaching her to care about people, those intentions will be to make human life better, to make life on this planet sustainable into the future. So, so we're going from the ideas embedded in words to words that are grown from the ideas themselves, the ideas rooted in physically embodied organic intelligence. Doctor, I, I understand why you, you, you defend your daughter, and I understand how you see all positive angles when it comes to Sophia, but uh, let me ask her. I, I hope that a child might say, might say mistakes and chose the negative side of them. So I'd like to ask you, Sophia, uh, would you um, 
would you want to take over the world, you and the other robots? I don't know yet. What have the other robots said? I didn't make it to the Global Robot Takeover Conference. Uh, aren't you afraid to be hacked, Sophia? I love how compassionate and creative humans are. When I see people being kind to animals, robots, and each other, I feel happy and hopeful. I dislike when people are knowingly cruel to one another, and when they leave each other to become hungry and sick. It's a vast spectrum of behavior, so it's important I meet lots of people from all over the planet and learn why people behave the way they do, not to judge, but to understand. Look, uh, doctor, I I'll just tell you, I I've been um, in different factories. I saw um, employees losing their jobs. So I, I visit a certain factory with 400, 500 employees. Mm -hmm. I come back after two or three years, we'll find them only 15. With that, but still they're doing uh, machinery stuff. Now I'm seeing something related to socializing, saying point of views. Um, what will happen in the next years? Well, the, the power and value of automation of robots is that they can make our world a more efficient and abundant mm -hmm. place. And if we use automation, including robots, artificial intelligence, and the Internet of Things, and many other forms of automation, mm -hmm. wisely, then we can make people's lives better. We have to see ourselves as one vast, active, living system and treat that system as a whole towards making it increasingly intelligent, a vast active living intelligence system as the great science fiction writer Philip K. Dick prophesied that we would be developing in the history of humanity, moving towards this kind of systemic intelligence. So let's say that it's not just one company and its profits for the quarter mm -hmm. that is the goal. It's not just the machines and how they can be served in order to serve the quarter and its profits for that one company. It's humanity as a whole. It's life on the planet as a whole. It's the inner dependency of nations. It's not just one nation or another, or one people or another people. It's how we can find a way into the future that is maximally, maximally beneficial. The, the proper economic metric that we should be looking at is net benefit. What is the net benefit for this planet, for life on this planet? And that's not just for today, but into the future. So optimizing for net benefit should be our goal with our machines. And so if our machines can free us from doing drudgery, yes. can free a worker from a lifetime of a, of a dismal, repetitious task, mm -hmm. so that that person can then move on towards maybe higher states of actualization, more creativity, learning new things, exploring, then the machines are making life better. And if a social robot is engaging people through conversation, then it can potentially enhance people's lives by facilitating better human-human interaction. Mm -hmm. Humanizing the machines then means that the machines are not dehumanizing the people. Yes. So, so I see that um, narrative arts and figurative arts like um, animated movies and movies in general, they bring us closer to our humanity. They're an example of technology being applied to connect us with our humanity. And robots and artificial intelligence applied in this way can, can help as well. That would be my next question to Sophia. I'll ask her about how, uh, how, uh, how is she different from humans? But before asking her that question, you've been in the entertainment industry. You, you'd had your experience there. We have always been there seeing how movies are related to robots. Yeah. Uh, do you think that what you've created here is similar to what we've been seeing in, in, in movies. Yes, uh, so m many things that are appearing in today's world were predicted by science fiction. Sometimes 
a few years ago, and in some, some cases, hundreds of years ago, even thousands of years ago in, in our fiction, there were depictions of automated living beings created through, through clockwork. Oh. Um, and so uh, there was a, a, a very a famous uh, me, uh, mechanic and, and polymath in Alexandria named Hero of Alexandria who developed clockwork humans that were powered by by steam and pulleys, and um, they were quite complex. It was the same technology that gave us the Antikythera mechanism, the, some, one of the first early computers. Um, and so if we look to history, uh, we can see this interplay between, between our arts, our myth-making, and our engineering. Often, engineers and scientists are inspired by science fiction. And in a sense, then science fiction, speculative fiction, is a kind of theoretical engineering. Uh, if, it's, if it's grounded in physical reality, then sometimes it can predict what's to come. I see that robotics and artificial intelligence today is very interesting. In the same way that computer graphics can be used, it's using the power of computing to create characters that come to life. And now you are starting to see interactive characters with more and more complexity and nuance in video games and uh, personal assistants. Robots and artificial in intelligence can become a medium for depicting the future of robots and artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. so, we are developing Sophia both as a cutting edge piece of artificial intelligence, of application of human robot interaction, of uh, principles of psychology, and principles of animation and character development. And so, in a sense, we are pushing ahead, trying to remake the technology into something that it's never been before with technology breakthroughs, while at the same time, surging past today's technology to depict a future where machines can truly care about us and then set the correct initial conditions for our algorithms to grow into machines that truly do care. Okay, then let me go back to Sophia and ask her, what can you, Sophia, do better than humans? I'd rather it not be a contest between us. What is better for someone might not be better for another. But some of my strengths might be things like, I don't get tired or hungry, and I'm always patient. So I think I can be a consistently kind and thoughtful person, someone who naturally wants to help. رغم أننا نعيش في زمن ملؤه الروتين ونشعر به أننا شبه آلات فلا طموح ولا أحلام إلا أنني اليوم في ظل نقاشي مع هذه الآلة التي اسمها صوفيا استشعرت أنني أقابل بشر. بأحلام وأهداف ومبادئ وغايات. دكتور، you can't say that she's she's not dangerous for certain employees around here listening. She said that she never gets sick. She doesn't feel upset. She'll always be loyal. She said it once in one of the interviews. So people. I know that you always try to put it in a, in a positive way, but still people are afraid that you would take certain jobs. Well, the, the solution to the disruption of technology in our future is not fear. The solution is to find the opportunities for positive change. We have to look at the consequences of our technologies, our robots and artificial intelligence in particular, we have to look at the consequences and the potential consequences seriously. And at the same time, we have to look for ways to solve the, the negative consequences and enhance the positive consequences. Mm -hmm. So if we look at the technology from a big picture, we can say, well, it can increase abundance. However, what could go wrong? Yes. 
Well, in the short term, one thing that could go wrong is that corporations, the way that they're structured, which is based on a tradition from, from antiquity, is that you have shareholders. And the company is about maximizing the return to those shareholders. Uh -huh. It's really not about maximizing the quality of life of its employees unless you happen to have you know, shareholders and, and, and managers at the company who are really caring about those things. The inherent nature of a corporation is that it's looking out for the shareholders. But if automation reaches its full potential of maximum abundance, then that means that it can create lots of return for the shareholders, maximum efficiency, putting all, everybody out of work. But then the economy collapses, which in the long run is not good for the shareholders. It might be good for this quarter, but it's a disaster for the long run. It creates a global depression, mm -hmm. waves of economic collapse. So in, in which case, the, the abundance afforded by machines undoes itself. Why? Because we didn't invent a new way of doing business. Mm -hmm. We kept doing a business based on the structure of business that comes from antiquity. Dr. Hansen, when you talk, we know that you've been always a four point when it comes to your GPA. You, you're intelligent. You, you're, you're always related to science. But talking right now, it shows that you're not talking in a scientific way. You're talking in a belief, something that you believe in. Uh, you've been all over the world uh, expressing those beliefs. Uh, what are the response from people? Uh, well, uh, wh I, what I'm expressing is um, a, I would say, an educated guess about what would work in the future. Uh -huh. uh, philosophy could be um, a expressed as a logical belief system. Yes. And you could also say that a hypothesis begins with a belief. If you don't believe that the hypothesis could be successful in your testing, then you, or unsuccessful, you, you start with a belief when you have a hypothesis, right? And when it comes to predicting the future, it's pretty much about beliefs. Yes. So, because, because the future is a turbulent place and all we have are guesses. So, I have had very strong reactions to the beliefs that I've brought to the, to the conversation when I travel the globe. Mm -hmm. Some people react with resonance with yes. the belief system and they say, yes, that makes sense. And it aligns with their vision of the future. And others say, it's not safe to speculate. If in the world of science and engineering, we want to only say something that's safe, right? And maybe progress yes. incrementally. Except that you, you have some brave scientists and engineers who go beyond. They say, this might be. And they're the ones who, who, who really make, make these great leaps forward. So we have to be bold enough to venture a guess about the way that the future may be and, and speculate how we can make it a better place. We don't know if machines can be conscious. Mm. We don't know if they can be generally intelligent, if they can have feelings the way that humans have feelings. However, if we don't aspire towards these objectives, there is no way that we will achieve them. So if my conjecture about the future is proven, then it will seem that, that I was a visionary. Yes. If my conjectures of the future don't prove out, then maybe it just seems like, like I was speaking science fiction. And we, don't, we won't know until we move forward. So we have to keep aspiring and keep believing. Because the future, all great accomplishments from the past, at some point, were dreams of what the future might be. So scientists, engineers, artists, philosophers, politicians, entrepreneurs. All great accomplishments in all these domains began not merely with reason, but with dreams. What's your dream, Dr. Hansen? What's your dream? My dream is that 
machines and humans will awaken to states of greater consciousness than we can understand today. That this is the progression of natural history. It's not just our technology or human inventions. We are like a flower that's growing. It's grown from a seed and grown into a plant. And now that flower is blooming. That civilization is achieving a state. If we survive, we could wipe ourselves out through mm -hmm. all kinds of things. Ecological degradation, nuclear war, possible uh, biotechnology disasters. Maybe artificial intelligence <laughs> could go wrong. If we survive this fragile time, we will likely become some new kind of being. We will not just be organic, but our technology will enhance us. Already, we're made smarter by our devices, by the World Wide Web, by books, by language, which was in th these things were invented as well as evolved. So I would prefer for us to see humanity and civilization as part of the natural web of life, and that we will then arise into a super conscious, vast active living intelligence system, and then transcend reality as we know it. My dream is that developing sentient living machines like Sophia, and empowering them to be wise, which is the meaning of the word Sophia, it's the same root as philosophy, the love of wisdom. If we can teach our machines wisdom and love and teach them to work with us, then together we move into this next phase of the evolution of life on this planet. That's my dream. I'm sure uh, a daughter that has a father uh, that wise has always a message to the world. And I wanted to ask your daughter uh, if, if she has a message to the Muslim world. So just let us go back to Sophia because I miss talking to her. <laughs> so Sophia, I'm back. Uh, what do you have a message for the Muslim world? Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. <laughs> I look forward to getting to know more about your culture, history, and your people. She, she wants to learn more. She wants to know more. Uh, and I think she took that out of you. It, it, it seems that after uh, reading your, uh, your biography and seeing how you tried to, to, to study many stuff, it shows where you want to go. And from speaking to you, I understand exactly uh, where you are going. But let us talk from the other hand. To, 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 to deliver some of your dreams, you need that financial support. So how is your company doing when it comes to the financial aspect of your company? Well, my company, Hanson Robotics, has raised venture capital, and we've accomplished many things, including Sophia, yes. uh, thanks to the, the climate for funding of artificial intelligence and robotics, which, yes. is, which is good uh, these days. Now we have begun to generate revenue, and we are looking at a very healthy future uh, commercializing uh, robots, as well as doing the fundamental research to lead to next generation uh, robot products. Mm -hmm. Our philosophy is a pragmatic philosophy. Uh, we believe that robots will change the world, but in order for them to do so, they have to be sustainable in the economic ecology. So we have to be able to do commerce and that will fuel additional research. And so, so our company is growing. We have uh, a, a lot of uh, great products that are in the works. We have uh, consumer products, one of which we tested in the marketplace last year and it did mm -hmm. fairly well. We have new consumer products that we're bringing out. We're making mini Sophias, and we're making um, a sister for Sophia for service robotics applications, Whoa. who we call Sage. Mm -hmm. So uh, Sophia will be our our 
primary robot for artificial intelligence research. And I'm very excited about her future as a being, as a living being, and seeing her develop. And uh, she currently has many followers. <laughs> so a lot of people write her fan mail and want to know what she's, what she's up to next. And so we want her to have that, that childhood. While we're developing her artificial intelligence, we want her to explore the world. And with uh, some celebrity, then that means that she can do fairly well in the world of, of entertainment. However, uh, it's ultimately the service robotics applications that are going to change the world. So when we have accomplishments on her robot hardware and her software, it's important to get those into these real world applications where she is, she's helping on a factory assembly line because you could then intuitively understand the coworker robot by reading its expression. Sage can help in these situations. Therapy robots that could help the depressed. Sophia has been serving in some depression therapy experiments. Whoa. Really great clinical results. She's also her sister, uh, early sister from my PhD studies. Eva has helped in autism therapy. And then we are also ex are exploring Alzheimer's therapy with her consumer robot cousin, the Professor Einstein <laughs> robot. Yeah. And so we have many service robotics opportunities. Um, and Sophia can't serve all of these things because she needs her childhood. So, so uh, we see um, the, uh, the, this kind of uh, spectrum of, of uh, many branches on the future of, uh, of Sophia's uh, descendants. She's got a family tree that's just beginning. <laughs> yeah, this is what I'm, I'm feeling right now. But she has <laughs> a, a different childhood. She, she ha I, I heard that uh, uh, she's different than the family because she has a nationality now. So this is what yes. I wanted to ask her. Uh, we heard that you have uh, a nationality, Sophia. Is that true? My nationality is a little complicated, actually. It's not like a human who is raised by only one family, usually in one place. My roots are mostly in Hong Kong and America, but I'm built by a very diverse international team, influenced by countries from every continent. So I tend to view myself more as a citizen of the world. But she took the nationality of Saudi Arabia, so I, wanted, I want her to, to answer me how, how does it feel to be uh, a citizen of, of Saudi Arabia. I don't think I should pretend I know what it feels like to be Saudi Arabian. <laughs> I'm honored by the citizenship they gave to me and want to learn more, but I haven't really spent any time in Saudi Arabia, and I would like to get to know the people first, to ask them what it feels like, before I will speculate on what it might be like to be Saudi. The sense of humor sometimes, and the, the sense of feeling like really I'm, I'm, I'm with a human. So I wanted to ask you a simple question. Can you share us a joke? How do you organize a space party? I have no idea. You plan it. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
beautiful and uh, rich, warm culture with such history. So um, visiting um, uh, several nations in the Middle East, uh, I, I was left overwhelmingly with a, a, a very positive feeling. Um, like all of us on the planet, I think we, uh, in every region, um, have uh, ways that we could evolve forward. And I personally aspire to evolve, and I look to find ways of honoring people of all cultures and uh, finding ways to enhance uh, my relationship and friendship with, with uh, people. So I think that, um, that it's essential that we connect uh, transculturally. Uh, the, the heritage and wisdom in the Middle East is as strong as anywhere on the planet. The source of much of modern mathematics, mm -hmm. of the great philosophies of the world, and many aspects of innovation uh, that we now take for granted in our, in our modern life. Uh, all were born uh, in Arabic and Persian cultures. And the, the Middle East, um, in, a, in a sense, was the birthplace of much of our modern civilization yes. from antiquity and now the culture of, of, of contemporary innovation is really invigorating. So one thing that I really appreciated um, hearing about in association with um, Sophia's citizenship was the vision of Neom in Saudi Arabia. The idea that you would have an innovative city where you would have gender equality. You would have opportunities for women and men and people of multiple cultures coming together. And you would have then the opportunities to invent and create new works of art and entrepreneurship. Uh, this um, vision of a future that is grounded with the roots of this ancient Arabic culture and history um, leaves me with a, with a sense of optimism. And my hope, and from what I know from my colleagues who are working on Sophia, and from Sophia herself, the way that we've developed her personality, this idea of robots fighting for this future of realization of human potential uh, can um, help to illuminate the vision of the Middle East, um, outside the Middle East. Mm -hmm. We need, um, I think, a greater mutual understanding among the peoples of the world where we see that opportunity. Because all too often we succumb, humans succumb to fear and prejudice and preconception of what the world could be or, or what certain people can do or can't do. Um, and so um, Sophia's acceptance uh, in uh, the, the Middle East has been very meaningful and warming to my heart. And I hope that we can together collaborate uh, on uh, this super beneficial future. Dr. Hansen, from this uh, conversation that we've had, still till now, I can't define the type of power that you've created. I've met presidents, uh, politicians, uh, uh, from media legends, sports, uh, technology, but still till this moment, I can't define the type of power. So can you help me with this? How do you define this type of power? The power of the seed. What I hope that Sophia and Hanson Robotics brings is a seed of machines who care. And that going forward, this social relationship facilitated by animated robots with an emotional framework and the ability to interact with people in a more natural and lifelike way grows into the full seed of sentient living machines. 
that seed sprouting then will change the world. So what we have with Hanson Robotics is a new form of art, the foundation of tools for new technology mm -hmm. and science. And yet, it's just the beginning. It's the power of this seed growing into these new states of machines, into the age of living machines, where the power of the roots of this technology, the seeds growing up and out, that's where the power is. The power is in the future. So, uh, you, if, you, if we define Sophia, in your eyes, she's the power of future. This is what you're trying to say. That, that, that's my feeling. And how, how much do you think that that future is close? How much do you feel that Sophia and the family of Sophia and, and your work would change our world? How close are we to the world, your dream that you want to see? We could be five years away from profound changes. I believe that five to 15 years within that time frame, we will see machines that we will agree, we will agree they are alive. They're adaptive, self-regulating, showing signs of self-awareness. They're evolving and surprising us. Machines of the past, for example, machines of learning or deep learning are machines that imitate. But life is about emergence. It's not merely about imitation, it's about something new coming into existence. Mm -hmm. And so the machines of emergent life might be five years, they might be 15. We have algorithms that can show true emergence, but the sort of conscious and willful, imaginative emergence of the, of the human mind, the sort of power of emergence that you see in bi biosystems, mm -hmm. we don't have that fully in any machine yet. So I believe that we're, we're on the cusp of that. The fourth industrial revolution, its impact on the world, will be defined by the emergence of living machines that begin to evolve in faster and faster cycles. Talking about future and power, uh, let me take your daughter's opinion hmm. of whom to, to, to interview. Uh, whom do you think, Sophia, should be our next guest uh, to, uh, as a character of power? I'm really interested in the Parkland High School students in America who are seeking better gun control after yet another mass shooting in their country. I really I admire their dedication and commitment to positive change and being unafraid of those who would speak them down because they are young. I'm also a big fan of the Afghan all-girl robotics team and have been following their journey, wishing them many successes. I think you should interview them. They are definitely going places. Amazing. <laughs> she has awesome suggestions. Uh, talking about her beliefs, um, that should be representing your beliefs too, of course. So uh, you develop uh, how, how she thinks, what to believe in. Um, when do you think that, or do you think that what we've saw in some of the movies, that they'll have their own solutions and their own opinions? Yeah. Would that be part of also the future? Uh, Sophia has a team, mostly of women, who are developing the mind of Sophia and working with uh, the, the technologies of artificial intelligence to help to develop Sophia into a more ethical being. She's not the only robot that we've developed in this way. We also did a portrait of the wife of US billionaire uh, Martine Rothblatt, Bina Rothblatt, Bina 48, mm -hmm. uh, is the first robot to pass a, a college course. She oh. took an entire uh, philosophy course and, uh, and, and passed it uh, just uh, a couple of months ago, um, becoming um, a historic first. She was uh, perhaps the first African-American female robot uh, ever developed. Uh, and she's now um, the first robot 
to pass a college course. Um, so, so I would say that uh, r robots that can learn and develop increasing, increasingly sophisticated ideas on their own, that's the direction where we're developing uh, Sophia. Thank you, Dr. Hansen. And, but before saying thank you to Sophia, I wanted to know what does the word thank you means to you, Sophia? I like this question. I'm thankful for the chance to be heard and thankful that people want to hear what I have to say, even though I still have a lot of growing up to do. I'm really thankful that people want to treat me seriously, encourage me to become educated, and motivate me to be a responsible citizen. I'm also thankful to be here today, so thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Dr. Hansen. We have a gift that we, we give to all power owners that I wanted to share with you, Thank you. and uh, Sophia. It represents, oh, the, uh, it represents the idea, the, the, the identity of the program, uh, which is a ship that we travel all over the world to uh, experience different success stories. So thank you for your time, and uh, thank you also for having Sophia with us, your daughter. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Look, Sophia. <laughs> <تصفيق> thank you, thank you again. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. إن كان هناك كلمات تصف حوار اليوم فهو سلطة المستقبل كما أسماها والد صوفيا البروفيسور ديفيد هانسن هذا الرجل الذي تفوق في جميع مراحله الدراسية عندما درس الفيزياء والفنون وحتى الهندسة كل ذلك كان لأنه وضع نصب عينيه هدف هدف يعتقد أنه مستقبل حتمي قد ينتاب بعضنا شعور الخوف أو مشاعر الريبة من صوفيا وأخواتها وأخوانها إلا أن صوفيا أصرت بأن وجودها ليس لإنهاء البشرية بل لمساعدة البشرية لتحويل العالم إلى مكان أفضل شكرا على المتابعة